There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Here I am with a review of The Quarry Wood, a 1928 Scottish novel by Nan Shepherd. And I absolutely loved it. It was a five star read. I wasn't sure that it was going to quite make it to a five star rating, but by the end, it absolutely, unquestionably was. Uh, what a delightful novel. Nan Shepherd died in 1981, in, she was about 80, and she wrote three novels that are kind of considered to be a trilogy of sorts. This was the first one. And this is an extremely self-assured debut. She wrote three novels before she turned 40, and then she never wrote any more fiction. She did a lot of other writing. And she's kind of known as the mother of Scottish literature. I am in love with Nan Shepherd on the basis of how much I loved this novel. So the first thing to say is that it, it is a challenging read because most of the dialogue, not the expository prose, but most of the dialogue is in a very thick Scotch dialect or certainly a lot of Scotch expressions. There is a short glossary at the back. It's not enough. So I went searching on Google in order to make sense of a lot of the dialogue. And if you don't like doing that, maybe this book isn't for you. But I got into it and loved it. And I learned some new stuff. I learned some new lingo. With that out of the way, it is a it is a coming age story about Martha. Hey, this is editing Sean, and I kind of botched this part of the review, so let me insert this comment: the story of Martha and her family. It's set in a small village that's more rural than urban, and the kind of place that her family lives in is called a kale yard. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that meant literarily in a minute. But a kale yard was basically a house with a small vegetable garden. So it was a little bit country-ish, but usually in a village. I think I've got that right. Somebody will correct me in the comments below if I've still not got it correct. In the introduction to this book, I learned the word kale yard. And there was a school of Scottish literature, the Kale Yard School from about 1890 to maybe 1920, something like that, that was overly sentimental, rustic tales of country bumpkin life. And this book is not like that. It is not overly sentimental. It's in many ways very stark, but the portraits of her, the family she came from are anything but sentimental. There is a compassion to Nan Shepherd's vision in that none of the people in the book are completely villainous. In the hands of a lesser writer, maybe some of them, some of her, maybe including her parents, would be. But such a well-rounded portrait of her local yokel father, Geordie, and her mother, Emmeline. I think the pronunciation would be Emmeline, not Emmeline. Emmeline? Um, who married beneath her family's status and has been quite ostracized by her family since the marriage and is a piece of work in and of herself, Emmeline. And one of the weird things about Emmeline is that she can't stop taking in bastard children, strays, any, I don't know where she finds, Martha, her own daughter, doesn't understand where she finds these kids, but she, the, the house is overrun with kids that are not biologically related, that she takes care of them, but then she doesn't really take care of them. She's very kind of lazy, so it's just a, a chaotic house. Martha wants to become a teacher, so she goes to university, and in her family it was unheard of, never mind any woman in Scotland, certainly of, of the lower middle class. So it's that kind of a coming-of-age story with a lot of humor and pathos, and I thought the characterization was so rich. I struggled a bit in the middle when she started falling in love. I thought her your romantic yearnings, maybe that part of the story didn't age well or I didn't respond to that as much, but that ended up being a very small part of the story. And it's her intellectual growth, her making peace with the background that she came from in a way that was really, I don't know, holistic. I think that's a word that I hate to use, but I'll, I'll, we'll go with that. So without giving any spoilers, there is a 
process at the end of the novel where she makes a connection with one of these kids because she was really standoffish with these kids. I don't know, I'm busy, I'm studying, I don't know, I don't have time for all these kids. And something happens in her and between her and one of the kids at the end of the novel that was just masterfully portrayed. Also, one of the important women in her life was her Aunt Josephine, I think her great Aunt Josephine, actually. And at the end of the novel, she takes care of her as she is dying. And I don't think, I mean, if you look at the table of contents, you'll see the final chapter is Death of Aunt Josephine, so I'm not spoiling anything, but uh, it is a long, drawn-out death, and the way Nan Shepard showed how much that long, drawn-out caretaking process really helped shape Martha's character, I just, I don't remember reading anything like that in any novel. It was so well done. Humor and some very serious themes treated with so much compassion. Nature is very important to Nan Shepard. She did a lot of nature writing, and there's gorgeous descriptions of the natural environment in here, if you're into that sort of thing. I'm not really, but I thought it was beautiful. But this is a novel that is really going to stick with me. I can't wait to read the next in the trilogy, and I actually don't know yet how loose or tight of a trilogy it is. Will it be the same character? I don't know. But the next one is called The Weather House, and I have that on the shelf. Let me end with a page that shows Martha. She's living at home. She's studying for university. She's trying to study in this chaotic house, and there's no money. I mean, there's just enough money for her to go to school, but her mother, Emmeline, insists on giving her money to take the train, but Martha doesn't want to spend that money on the train she wants to spend that money on candles so she can stay up late in her room, which she's sharing with one of these, not sisters, but another girl in the house, studying late into the night. And the only way she can have a candle is if she doesn't pay. So she, so she secretly bikes to the school. So her mother is Emmeline, Emmeline, and her father is Jordy. I'll do my best with the pronunciation, but it's not going to be that great. So here she is coming home after school in the pouring rain. At the foot of the long bray to the cottage, she stumbled from her machine. Light had gone from the earth. The sleet drove now upon her side as she battled uphill, pushing her bicycle. Thought began to stir again when she reached the puddle at the gateway of the field. She went straight ahead through the puddle, because it mattered little now how much wetter she became, and with that she began to wonder what reproach her mother would have ready. She had not even candles for consolation. Oh, because of a variety of reasons she couldn't actually buy candles that day. She had not even candles for consolation. And Emmeline would say next morning, You've got your money for the train. She tumbled her cycle into the shed and pushed open the house door, standing dazed a moment on the threshold. Emmeline's back was towards the door as she bent over the fire and stirred the sowins for supper. Without turning, when one of the children said, Here's Matty come, she complained to her daughter. You've taken a terrible like time to come up for the station. Martha's heart fluttered and thumped, and pulses beat hot and hurried in the chill of her temples. So her mother had not been in the shed, and did not even know that the cycle had been taken out. It's a terrible night, I'm wet through, she said. But the wedding had suddenly become of no importance. Her mind did not even run forward to the pennies she had gained. The mere relief from an immediate onslaught by her mother's tongue was joy enough. She went in a sort of stupid excitement to remove her dangling clothes, but she had to call Madge through from her pansy novelette to help her strip. Madge is the quote-unquote non-sister that she's sharing the room with. Pansy novelettes were kind of like romantic novels. Geordie came in soaked too. The fireplace was hung with dripping garments and the iron kettles perched with sopping boots. The steam of them eddied about the room, mingling with the wood smoke blown back from the chimney. Emmeline worked herself into a lather of vituperation at the weather and the folk, but gave the latter none the less of their sowins in ample measure, smeared with syrup and piping hot. She set the boys to feed the fire with branches and logs of pine. Every now and then a resinous knot spluttered and sang, flared out in blobs and fans of flame. Emmeline made no economies with fire. She loved heat. The little kitchen was shortly stuffed with a hot reek 
the reek of wood and folk and sewins, wet clothes, steaming dishwater, and bogey roll. For once, Martha did not regret her lack of candles. She was shivering violently from her exposure and glad of the heavy heat of the kitchen. She sat at the deal table, catching her share of light from the lamp upon her open school books. Jordy was playing snakes and ladders with the bairns, Madge and the eight- and nine-year-old boys. There was no Dussie now. Something less than three years after her arrival, Mrs. Ironside, that's Emmeline, Mrs. Ironside had polished her one day according to her lights and taken her away. Her folk reclaimed her. Dussie was in a whirl of excitement. She had tangled the processes of washing and dressing with fifty plans for interminable futures, and Martha was to share her fortune in her favor. They had not seen her since. I love this novel. I think many of you might too. Check it out. Thanks for watching. Oh.